Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Lunch with Books live stream. Uh, we're back this week. Those of you who uh, know Wheeling's history well will remember that uh, the infamous Joe McCarthy uh, sort of launched uh, that for which he is in infamy here in Wheeling. Uh, and uh, our guest today uh, sort of launched uh, that on. for which he is in infamy here in Wheeling getting feedback from my own computer. Sorry about that. Our guest today will tell you more about that. He has written a new biography called Demagogue about Mr. McCarthy. His name is Larry Ty. He, he is a journalist, was a journalist at the Boston Globe, Anniston, Alabama Star, and Louisville Courier Journal, and a Neiman Fellow at Harvard. His books range from uh, one about Negro League's legend Satchel Page and Superman to explorations of the Jewish diaspora, the Pullman Porters, and many others. Um, and he's here today, as I mentioned, to tell you about Senator Joe McCarthy. So here's Larry Ty. <clears throat> so thank you, Sean. And it's great to be with you almost in Wheeling. And what I would like to do is um, one of the things that Sean didn't mention is that there have been probably a hundred previous biographies on Joe McCarthy, and he is much too light, uh, polite to ask the question that should be on everybody's mind when they see a hundred and first book come out on somebody, which is why the heck do we need that hundred and first one? And I want to tell you a bit about some of the things that I had access to that previous people who looked at Joe McCarthy over the last 70 years didn't. And the first was a set of papers that were out there at the time I started my research. And those were all the transcripts, 9,000 pages of transcripts of the hearings that Joe McCarthy held when he kicked out the press and told the public to take a walk. And he was there alone in private session, he and his staff and the witnesses and the transcripts of these hearings, those 9,000 pages, were embargoed for 50 years. And it is only recently that those were made public. And while people had written the next day stories on those transcripts and their release, nobody had taken a deep dive into them. And they show Joe McCarthy unhinged. It was him when he thought nobody was looking. It was him when he didn't have to pay attention to even giving token acknowledgement that the people before him had any rights. It was him assuming that the people who came before him were guilty. And it was him violating all the traditions and norms of the, new, the US Senate by holding one man hearings. He was almost always the only senator there and when he wasn't there presiding over the hearings and grilling the witnesses, it was his sophomoric staffers who took over the grilling. So that is number one trove of papers, 9,000 pages. And one last thing that those 9,000 pages showed, and I thought initially it was my imagination, and then the more records I saw outside of those hearings, the more I realized it was true, they showed that in the mornings when Joe McCarthy was holding those closed door hearings and was sober, his questions were sober. He was serious. He was at least marginally respectful of the people who came before him. But in the afternoon, after he had had his standard lunch of a hamburger, a raw onion, and whiskey, he became much more impatient. He didn't want to hear witnesses talking back to him. He had a fuse that was this short in the afternoon. And if you knew what you were doing and you knew his pattern, you sure as heck didn't want to appear before Joe McCarthy in the afternoon and especially not in the early evening. So again, one set of documents that nobody had ever really looked at carefully, which were all of these transcripts. A second set was the military and medical records of the senator. Um, the, he was treated 
regularly during the time he was a senator at Bethesda Naval Hospital. Like most of our medical records, those were kept under lock and key. And for some reason, um, when I asked, the military said, yes, they would let me see those. And they let me see his wartime records and his medical records. And again, those showed a different side of Joe McCarthy. Those showed Joe McCarthy, the alcoholic, and it wasn't just my speculating at this point, it was his doctors recording how much he drank over time. Those showed that while the official cause of death for Joe McCarthy when he died in 1957, the coroner's report said he died of acute hepatitis. Every newspaper in America repeated that he died of acute hepatitis. And I am here to tell you he did not die of acute hepatitis. He died after having suffered horrible DTs and watching his fever spike to 107, he died of the effects of alcohol. And it's not just me saying that, it was a group of doctors that I sat down with, including the retired dean of the Harvard Medical School and the retired editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine. There was a consensus among them of just how bad he was affected by alcohol starting in his early days as a senator and getting much worse in his later days. And again, that's what he died of. So records number one, the hearings that nobody had seen. Records number two, the medical and military records that nobody had seen. But the real golden grail, the stash of records that every biographer before me had wanted to see was the, again, stash of personal and professional files of Joe McCarthy that his wife had donated not long after he died to his alma mater, Marquette University. And those were there to be seen or not seen based on permission from the McCarthy family. For 60 years, the family had either been saying no way or saying nothing at all, not responding when people asked to see them. They initially took the second approach with me no, no response at all. I tried everything that I could think of. And if, like Sean, you know me a little bit, you know that it's not because I am charming, which I'm not, that they ended up relenting. Uh, one day, I got an email from the chief archivist at Marquette, and she said, the only person in the world who is more surprised than me will be you when she was telling me that the family had said yes. Not just yes, that I could see the records, but yes, that I could see them exclusively. And when I stopped looking, the records would become, go back under lock and key. And what those records show, just telling you I had access to the records means nothing, but the records included Joe McCarthy's real time handwritten diaries when he was on the South Pacific Island during World War II. And they showed that he was in fact the Marine hero that he said he was and that nobody believed he was. They included his love letters to his, wit to his wife. They included documents stamped top secret from the FBI and the CIA that were leaked to Senator McCarthy. They included everything that a biographer would dream of having and that no biographer had had until I came along. And I think there were two reasons the family might have let me see them. One is because I had, arguing my case, a woman who is a famous TV journalist named Greta Van Susteren, and her father was Joe McCarthy's best friend. And Greta was telling everybody in the McCarthy family, give this guy a look. The second reason is that I was a pain in the neck and I wouldn't go away. And I think they decided the only way to get rid of me was to say yes. I don't think they knew what was in the files. I'm not sure even McCarthy's wife who donated them knew because there were so many tens of thousands of papers that nobody could have gone through them. And when they went to Marquette, they were in a shambles like most people's records are after they die. And Marquette had had 60 years to organize them. They may be the best organized archives anywhere in the world. They were extraordinary. And the bottom line is, if I couldn't write a good book, given all the stuff that I was given to help me write a good book, then shame on me.
I'm much too close to say whether I did write a good book, but I sure as heck should have given what I had access to. What I would like to do now in the rest of the time before I open it up to questions is walk you through three critical milestones in Joe McCarthy's life. Three moments from the time um, he began his career to late in his life and beyond uh, that I think tell us a bit about who he is and about things that I found out about him. And the first moment is appropriately in Wheeling, West Virginia, or as his staff referred to it, Wheeling West by God, Virginia, because most of them weren't sure where the heck the place was and what it was like. And on February 9, 1950, Joe McCarthy participated in Wheeling in a ritual, an annual ritual of Republican parties all across America. And the ritual is that on the birthday of Abraham Lincoln, Republicans use this as a way to gin up enthusiasm for the party and gin up money for the party. And when you're a really prominent Republican senator, you get invited to big places across the country like New York and Washington, Chicago, and San Francisco. When you're Joe McCarthy, a first-term senator who is seemingly almost guaranteed to be just a first-term senator, who is a backbencher, who's done nothing to distinguish himself, and who looks like he's on his way to being defeated the next time he's up for election. On that February 9th, 1950, the only place he got an invitation to give a speech was in Wheeling, West Virginia. So he came to your great city, and he brought with him a big, bulky briefcase. And in that briefcase, there were two speeches that he was thinking about delivering that night. The first was a snoozer of a speech on national housing policy. And had he picked that speech out of that briefcase that night, we wouldn't be here talking about Joe McCarthy 50 years later. But instead, he reached deep into his briefcase and he pulled out the second speech. And he waved that speech, I'm gonna let my camera refocus, he waved that speech up in the air. And he said, this is a speech, by the way, that I am convinced that he had never seen before he pulled out of his briefcase that night. And it was a barn burner of a speech. And he waved his papers in the air and he said, I have here in my hand a list of 205 communist spies at the State Department. These are people who are working for the Soviet Union. They are people that Franklin, uh, that I'm sorry, President Harry Truman should know about. And they're people that he has allowed to continue to work in the State Department and are a major threat to our country. Now, let me give you a little sense of what people in that audience were thinking before they came to that speech that night. These were everybody from mine operators to the famous um, and famously devoted Republican women of Ohio County. They were loyal party regulars who didn't really know who this guy Joe McCarthy was. But back in early 1950, they were people who, like the rest of America, had watched nationalist China recently become red China. They had watched the government catch and try and convict and sentence to death a couple atomic spies, a husband and wife duo named Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. They were about to watch an incredible thing that anybody who didn't live, bef uh, live through it wouldn't quite believe, but this was the so-called duck and cover campaign. We were about to teach school kids all across America that in the event the evil Soviet Union were to send an atomic bomb our way, the way to protect yourself was to put your hands over your head and duck under your desk. And if you did that duck and cover, you would be safe in the event of a nuclear attack. And as absurd as that may seem today, that is just how scared we were when Joe McCarthy came along and told us not only were we to be afraid of what was going on in the Soviet Union, but we had to be afraid of traitors 
in our own State Department. Lots of people before him, going back to the House on american Activities Committee 12 years before, had been shouting traitor, but none of them did what McCarthy did in cowboy fashion. He named the traitors and he counted them, and there were 205 of them, and he said he had a list in his hand naming all of them. Well, it was irresistible. Within two days, Joe McCarthy's charges were on page one of every newspaper in America. That first day, the only newspaper they were in was the Wheeling Intelligencer, but the Associated Press was there and they picked up the story and everybody was interested in Joe McCarthy and his charges. And for the next week, he wandered around outlying parts of the country from Nevada to uh, from Reno to Las Vegas to lots of other cities, not in the middle of America, um, not in places where there are a lot of reporters to question him. And his numbers changed. It was sometimes 205, it was sometimes 207, and it was sometimes 57. And to give you an idea of just how opportunistic he was and how little those numbers made any sense, I'm convinced now that his friends who joked back then uh, might have been right about where he came up with the number 57. Joe McCarthy was a big meat and potatoes guy. And his friends were convinced that one day on that short week-long tour after Wheeling, that he had stopped into a restaurant, had used Heinz 57 sauce, and that that number was one that caught his imagination. So instead of 205 spies, it became 57. But whatever the number, he never showed anybody the list, and he never had a real list of 205 or any other number of spies in the State Department. He had a bunch of recycled names from earlier investigations, many of whom were no longer working in the State Department, most of whom had never been communists and certainly not Soviet spies. By the time Joe McCarthy came along, most of the 24 carrot spies were long gone. And by the time he joined the hunt, the people who were the true red hunters didn't need Joe McCarthy. It was joked about him back then that he could have been dropped into the middle of Red Square on May Day and not recognize the true communist. And I think that was not far off the mark. So this is moment number one. This is when Joe McCarthy launches his crusade. And this happens to be a moment that happened in many of your hometown there of Wheeling, West Virginia, even though I'm convinced talking to journalists and others there, that most people in Wheeling have no idea that McCarthyism and the, the central piece of the Red Scare of the 1950s had its birthplace in your hometown. So that was 1950 in February. I now want to flash forward to the beginning of 1954. By 1954, Joe McCarthy had been going at it for a very long time, for four long years. By the beginning of 1954, he had accused not just the State Department of harboring communists, but the White House, the government printing office, and the Voice of America. And at the end of 1953, he went after his biggest target of all, the most democratic, in my mind, of American institutions, the U.S. Army. He charged that at an army base in uh, called Fort Monmouth in New Jersey, that there were nests of spies, nests of communist moles there, planted in part by the atomic spy Julius Rosenberg, never rooted out by the military, and they were posing a huge risk because that fort at Monmouth, New Jersey, was not just the command and control center for the U.S. Army, but for all of the U.S. armed forces. So he said, look, they can get at our vital information center, and they're there passing on secrets to the Soviets. And initially, the Army went along with him. They said, Joe, you give us the names. We will suspend those people, and we'll take care of it. Only they realized the more they looked into it, that he would never stop with the names, that his idea of pointing fingers at somebody had no 
connection to whether that person was really guilty of the spying he was accusing them of, and that he was also asking special treatment for a young aide of his, a guy named G. David Shine, uh, who along with his sidekick Roy Cohn, McCarthy's senior aide, were pushing the army into giving Shine special treatment. He had been drafted as a, a private he was out of everything from KP duty to the normal restrictions on going on leave. He'd head off and have parties in New York with his buddy Roy Cohn. And at some point, the Army finally, at the beginning of 1954, developed a backbone. And what that did was kick off the most famous set of congressional hearings in American history, the so-called Army McCarthy hearings. On one side of the table was the Army and all of their experts and lawyers. On the other side was Joe McCarthy and his sidekick, Roy Cohn and David Shine, and they went at it. At the start of those hearings in early 1954, Joe McCarthy, his popularity rating, according to the Gallup poll, was 50%. One in every two Americans thought he was doing a great job, and the only one with a higher popularity rating at that point among public figures in America was our war hero president, Dwight David Eisenhower. And it was extraordinary just how much of America had bought into this crusade that McCarthy launched in Wheeling, West Virginia. By the middle of those hearings, however, there was a magical moment. There was a moment where an attorney named Joe Welch uttered what might have been the most famous words an American lawyer has ever said. And that was, Senator, have you no sense of decency? At long last, have you no decency? And those words have been immortalized in history books. And those words were the supposed turning point of when Joe McCarthy started losing his public support. But I want to say that those words are not what they seemed. That in fact, Welch uttered those words when McCarthy attacked Welch's young associate and included, in, uh, accused him of being a leftist, if not a communist. In fact, Joe Welch had those words in his back pocket and was ready to take them out and use them against McCarthy when McCarthy said something that was truly outrageous. Welch understood McCarthy well enough to know that he was going to repeatedly say something that was outrageous. But I think by the time Welch actually said those words and questioned whether McCarthy had any sense of decency, all of America had already concluded, watching this guy day after day, that he in fact did have no sense of decency. And what happened was, the guy who started out the hearings looking like this great champion ended up the hearings looking like what he was, which was the town bully. He started out the hearings with 50% of America thinking he was doing a great job. And by the end, by August of 1954, his popularity numbers had plummeted from 50 to 34%. And the gig was up for Joe McCarthy. Suddenly, senators who had lacked the backbone to take on their powerful colleague, who they knew could bulldoze them into costing them their re-election the way he did with so many senators that he opposed, suddenly they developed backbone. Suddenly, Dwight Eisenhower, our war hero president, who had been coddling McCarthy for a year and a half and had been ignoring his own brother, Milton Eisenhower, who had been telling Dwight for that year and a half, take on the bully, give up a little of your popularity and bring down McCarthy. Well, Eisenhower didn't do it until McCarthy fell on his own sword and took on an enemy too big to bully in the army. And finally, Eisenhower started standing up. The Senate comes out with its report on those hearings in August of 1954. By December 1954, they're taking the extraordinary step of censuring one of their own colleagues. And that was, I think they had done it six times before in the entire history of the Republic. And from December of 1954 to his death two and a half years later in 1957, Joe McCarthy was a broken man. And it's not just that everybody who was around him told us that, 
it is, again, those Bethesda Naval Hospital records that we can see he went from being a heavy drinker to being a heavy alcoholic. He went from drinking too many drinks at lunchtime and a couple more at dinner to drinking the equivalent of a fifth of whiskey a day. And Joe McCarthy in 1957 died. So we've seen him at two points. We've seen him at the beginning of his crusade in 1950. Point number two was with the Army McCarthy hearings four years later in 1954. The last point I would like to take you to in the story of Joe McCarthy is today. Because I think McCarthy may have died in 1957, but I think McCarthyism is alive and well in America. And my book has the one word title of demagogue for a reason. It is because in American history, going back to our very beginning days of our founding fathers, there has been a uniquely American strain of bullying and demagoguery. And that starts with people um, that you may recognize like the senator and governor and dictator from Louisiana named Huey Long. It includes a famous senator from the Deep South named Theodore Bilbo. It includes a Jew-baiting radio preacher, an anti-Semitic preacher from Michigan named Father Charles Coughlin. All of them came before Joe McCarthy, and all of them are people who set the stage for McCarthy. Once we had McCarthy, he was the archetype or role model for every demagogue who came after. And that ranges from people like the Alabama governor and presidential candidate, George Wallace, like the Ku Klux Klan um, grand wizard and Louisiana uh, legislator, David Duke. And it goes to today. And here, if you don't want to hear me talk politics, you should block your ears now because I have to say that the politician in the wake of Joe McCarthy, who is using Joe McCarthy's playbook, whether you like that playbook or you don't like that playbook, more than anybody has ever done is our 45th president, Donald Trump. And I want to give you just a few instances of where I think that Trump has borrowed the McCarthy playbook. Demagogues in lieu of solutions point fingers. They understand brilliantly legitimate fears that the American people are experiencing. And back in the 1950s, the fear was the fear of the Soviet empire. Today, the fear is a fear of dislocation economically, a fear that people in states like West Virginia and every other state have been left behind by the American dream of prosperity. And that is a very legitimate fear. And it's something that politicians like they were responding in the 50s to the Soviet influence, ought to respond to. But instead of offering us answers, Joe McCarthy offered us lists of names of people who weren't what he said they were. And I think instead of offering answers today, we're being given reasoning that if we only built a wall on our Mexican border, all of this economic dislocation would somehow magically go away. So in lieu of solutions, they point fingers. When one bombshell that they are using explodes and sh is proven to be hollow, the next day, a demagogue or a bully lobs a fresh bombshell. When they're attacked, a demagogue aims a wrecking ball at their opponents. And lastly, and importantly to me as a lifelong journalist, when a demagogue can't charm a newsman or a newswoman, they blame them for the bad news. And I want to read to you um, two quotes that I think make my case maybe more succinctly than I could. One is the most famous quote that Donald Trump um, issued during the 2016 campaign. And you'll probably remember this. He was speaking to a group of supporters and he said, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, and I wouldn't lose any voters. 
exactly 62 years before that polling pioneer George Gallup said something chillingly similar about Joe McCarthy and his supporters. And this is what George Gallup said. Even if it were known that McCarthy had killed five innocent children, his supporters would probably still go along with him. Donald Trump, 62 years before Joe McCarthy. One last thing about the Trump and McCarthy connection, and that is there was a flesh and blood through line from Joe McCarthy to Donald Trump, and that was a brilliant, arrogant lawyer from New York named Roy Marcus Cohn. Roy Cohn was the guy that Joe McCarthy, when he took over in 1953, this very powerful permanent subcommittee on investigations, he needed a chief of staff, somebody to run his office. And he brought in as his number two, a young lawyer named Bobby Kennedy. But Bobby Kennedy didn't get the top job. The top job went to this guy, Roy Cohn. Roy Cohn, over the next couple years, reinforced every bad instinct in Joe McCarthy. He also learned at Joe McCarthy's knee every lesson of Joe McCarthy and McCarthyism. Half a century later, we come to New York and Donald Trump and his father, Fred Trump, wanted somebody to tutor young Donald when he was going into the cutthroat world of New York real estate. And they looked around and they ended up bringing in for that task a not so young lawyer named Roy Marcus Cohn. Cohn passed on to Trump every lesson on real politics, every lesson from Machiavelli, every lesson from Joe McCarthy on how to behave in this cutthroat world, first of New York real estate, and secondly, in the political world that Trump ended up entering. Every time something has gone wrong for Donald Trump over the last three years, he says, I wish I had at my side Roy Cohn, who died a number of years ago. What I think he's really saying is, I wish I had at my side, not my mentor, but my mentor's mentor, Joe McCarthy. And I would suggest to you that we're seeing a whole lot of things in Washington today that look a whole lot like the things we saw in Washington in the 1950s. I want to end with a more hopeful note. I want to end with what I think is the good news story of my book. It is counterintuitive to think that a book about a bleak character like Joe McCarthy could be a good news story, but my book really does have an uplifting message. And that message is looking at our long history in America of demagogues that given enough rope, every one of those demagogues throughout our history, like Joe McCarthy, has hung themselves. And given enough time in that long history, America has always rediscovered its better nature and decided it was no longer going to accept bullying behavior in its politics any more than it would in its classrooms. So what I would like to do, I've been talking at you for a long time. You've had to look at my picture on your screen for a long time. And if there's anybody still left there, and if you have any questions, I'd love to try to answer them. And I'm seeing the first question pop up on the screen. And I don't know if you can see this, so I'm going to repeat it. Um, it says, please tell us about Edward R. Murrow and McCarthy. Do we have journalists like him these days? Is it even possible for journalists to do what he did? So I want to start by reminding anybody who doesn't know who Edward R. Murrow was. He was somebody that before World War II, and especially during World War II, reporting from London during the Blitz, the Nazi Blitz on London, where they nearly bombed the city into oblivion. Edward R. Murrow was there reporting live. He proved himself to be the best radio reporter that America had and eventually the best TV reporter. And he's the role model for just about every broadcast journalist today in America. And Edward R. Murrow is credited with bringing down Joe McCarthy. Uh, there was a brilliant movie called Good Night and Good Luck, which made the case that Murrow was the guy who did in McCarthy. Uh, 
I'm here to tell you that Murrow didn't do in McCarthy, that as Edward R. Murrow himself acknowledged, and Murrow is one of my heroes, but as Murrow himself acknowledged, he was late to the game. He didn't really get involved until McCarthy started taking on the army. And his most damning reports were at the end of 53 and the beginning of 54. If there is one reporter in America who ought to be seen as the earliest and bravest of McCarthy's foes. It was a guy named Drew Pearson, a newspaper columnist, the most popular columnist in America, who also had the most popular radio show in America. Drew Pearson, after the famous Wheeling speech, wrote 60 scathing columns on Joe McCarthy. He took him on, he called him the fraud and the hoax, that fellow senators would eventually call him, and Pearson paid two prices for it. The first price was when the two of them met in a cloakroom in a fashionable Washington supper club, McCarthy started whacking around Pearson. And if it hadn't been for a famous Quaker peacemaker named Richard Nixon stepping in between the two of them, Pearson would have gotten totally pummeled that night by McCarthy. So he didn't, he was rescued that night, but there was nobody there to rescue him shortly after when McCarthy went after Pearson's biggest radio sponsor, the Adam Hat Company, told, McCarthy told his supporters, stop buying these hats unless the Hat Company stops underwriting Drew Pearson. The Hat Company listened, they withdrew their support. Pearson never found another sponsor as lucrative as that. And the message was clarion to every other reporter in America. You take on Joe McCarthy at your own risk. The second half of the question that um, appeared on my screen asked, do we have reporters that courageous today? And the answer is absolutely. They are taking from President Trump, I would argue, even more heat than McCarthy could apply to them because Trump is the president and McCarthy was just a senator. They are being called out in public. They are sometimes being threatened by the president's supporters when the president goes after them. And yet, day after day, reporters for the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wheeling uh, Intelligencer and other newspapers across America, along with TV stations and public radio and other outlets, are standing up and saying, this is wrong. They're calling out the president and senators and others when they think that needs to be done, and they're doing it at huge risk, because today it's not just a question of somebody being uh, accosted in a hat check room. It's a question of, via social media, you can expose the most private information of these journalists and make them truly vulnerable, and it is sad and it is courageous. And it's especially courageous, I ought to say, in a moment when journalists at most newspapers across America are watching their pay cut, are watching jobs being eliminated, and are often being furloughed, working and being paid for just four or three days a week. So Erin has a question, and I love the picture of her mask and, the, uh, and her dog's mask. We are currently living in a time where many have called for the removal of monuments honoring controversial figures. Other believe this is erases, this erases history. The bust of McCarthy was removed from the Outagami Courthouse in Appleton in 2001. It seems to me few have forgotten McCarthyism, least of all in Appleton in Wisconsin. When you were researching McCarthy in Wisconsin, did you experience any lingering sentiments from the residents of the state? So it's a great question. And that bust that Aaron is asking about I saw it had been in the courthouse and then it was in storage and now it is in the building, I'm pretty sure that houses, it, it's in my book and I think it was in the building that uh, in the museum in Appleton, Wisconsin, next to the bathroom, uh, an enormous bust of Joe McCarthy. And I think that, uh, that we have to remember our history and if a bust helps us do that, and tells the way that bus does in the plaque that goes with it, all sides of the McCarthy story, and tells all sides of the McCarthy story in a way that that museum did in its recent McCarthy exhibit, then I think that's 
a plus in helping us remember our history. Kids today don't know the history of Jim Crow segregation in America. And if our bus of segregationists um, were to help educate young people about that story the way I tried to in my book on Satchel Page and on the Pullman Porters, then I think that's a positive. Um, can we put that question back again? There was a second part of it that I'm now not remembering. Ah, did I experience any lingering sentiments from the residents of the state? And that's a great question. And I found that the same way Joe McCarthy could divide families in Wisconsin 70 years ago, it continued to do that today. People who were old enough to remember him, some of them would defend him to the death and others remembered the damage he did and would attack him. And different members of different families couldn't get together, um, different members of the same family couldn't get together often and talk about John McCarthy and not have a, um, not a fist flying, but a verbal accosting of one another because Joe McCarthy remains exceedingly controversial in America. Um, there are elements in, in the conservative movement in the country that want to redeem him. There are elements in a leftist movement in the country that want to vilify him. And where my book comes out is not in the middle because I take a strong stand on McCarthy, but it is to say that Joe McCarthy did have redeeming aspects of his career and life like his being a war hero during World War II, but the same way I found that some things about him um, where he was vilified were not true, I also found out in many, many other ways he was even more sinister than we thought, and the effect he had on people who he left in his wake was even more damaging. There were nearly a dozen people that I could count and prove had, that had taken their own lives because of Joe McCarthy. There were hundreds of careers that he smashed, and there were millions of people who were afraid to discuss certain aspects of politics because Joe McCarthy and McCarthyism made it dangerous to have certain political views. Republicans turned on McCarthy eventually. That really hasn't happened in 2020. Do I think it will happen? And is re-election more important than the judgment of history? Uh, this is supposedly in parentheses afterwards a nonpartisan question. Great. So I think it will happen. And I think that um, we're seeing poll numbers now eerily reminiscent of the poll numbers of, that Joe McCarthy was seeing before his censure by the Senate. And if those numbers hold up for the president, it suggests that he was not only using McCarthy's playbook in his rise to power, but he will be following McCarthy's playbook in his the leaving the Oval Office. Now, who knows what's going to happen? And I'm a terrible political prognosticator, and I'm not calling for any outcome other than that we continue learning from our history and not repeat all of these horrible mistakes that we keep making. When I started out my biography of Joe McCarthy, I thought this was a story of ancient American history and that we were too smart to repeat that history today. And it is instead the story of today. And it convinces me that we will always remain vulnerable to demagogues. And the only way to protect against that is to recognize what the sign of a demagogue is, and that's by looking at and understanding the story of the archetype of all of American demagogues, Joseph R. McCarthy. So I have a feeling, since I'm not seeing um, another question pop up, that that may be the end of questions. And instead of taking your time to mumble on more about Joe McCarthy. Um, I just want to say that, oh, I just want to say that um, I would not be presumptuous enough to tell you to buy my book, but you can see the local bookstore on your screen if you want to do that. And if you decide to buy the book, and if you decide that you would like a signature for that book, I wish I were there in person and could sign the books, but if you'd like a signature, just tell the bookstore that you want me to send the signature plate, I will personalize it to you 
they'll send me your information by email and we'll get it out soon before you pick up your book. So if you'd like that, I'd be glad to do it. And I just want to say that Sean has been incredibly patient because I'm a Luddite when it comes to computers. He's taught me how to make this platform work. He's wasted too much of his time having to do that. And I appreciate him having me there and you're showing up for today's session. Thank you very much, Wheeling, West Virginia. Thank you, Larry, and thanks for your kind words. Um, not at all. And uh, I want to remind people that uh, they can get the book at the Wheeling Artisan Center shop. Chris Philomagnus set that up for us, and I think Natalie Kovacs is, is managing it now. So give them a call or go online and you see the address down there. You can buy the book directly and have it mailed to your house. Um, thank you again, Larry. Excellent program. Very Thank you. And our first really political program. So <laughs> All right. See what happens. Uh, but uh, it was very good. And I want to remind people that next week at noon, Christine Kinley will be here to tell us about the Choctaw Nation's gift to Ireland during the Great Famine, which is another fascinating story. So we'll be signing off. And thanks again to Larry and everyone who attended today. Have a good one. Bye-bye.